So, uh, thank you, uh, Nick. It's my real pleasure to be here this afternoon and to discuss with you these uh, hard learning interactions, especially in the context of the COVID. Uh, of course, uh, because the disease is relatively recent, we do not have specific data in this context of uh, COVID, but nevertheless, we can uh, at this stage try to interfere from what we know in other type of um, um, lung disease like RDS and others, um, to try to understand what could be the heart-lung interactions in this kind of uh, COVID-19 pneumonia. So, the basic principle we need to look at is the fact that indeed the heart is in the chest and there is also a very specific relationship between the right heart and the left heart because both are joined into the pericardium. And uh, the changes in pleural pressure that will be uh, induced by the uh, mechanical ventilation um, will be transmitted to the pericardium and hence affect both the left heart and the right heart. One may expect these issues to be really uh, occurring mostly in patients with RDS because these are ventilated with the highest intrathoracic pressures. Nevertheless, one of the factors that may play a role in these conditions is the fact that the transmission of alveolar to pleural pressure is not really straightforward. Indeed, um, the transmission depends on the lung compliance. And basically, compared to normal, uh, the compliance um, is, uh, of course, altered in uh, patients with RDS. And hence, for a given uh, alveolar pressure, the uh, pleural pressure or the amount transmitted to the pleural pressure will be somewhat lower in RDS compared to normal conditions. In normal conditions, about one third of the pressure is transmitted uh, to the, uh, to the uh, pleura. However, um, in RDS, it can be much lower and sometimes 20 or even lower than 20% can be transmitted to the, um, uh, to the pleura. So the transmission is really decreased usually in low compliance states, uh, even though higher pressure is applied. And also we need to realize that collapsed areas do not transmit pressure. And of course, in these conditions, we know that the cardiovascular effects of mechanical ventilation are often more prominent in COPD patient or in asthma patient uh, ventilated with high volumes than in RDS patients uh, ventilated with lower volumes and uh, even though the pressure is higher. However, the COVID is somewhat special because indeed you realize that in many conditions the condensation is really not the prominent factor. And so what is exactly the transmission of alveolar pressure to pleura in uh, COVID-19 related RDS? So we have already some data showing that uh, we have uh, a very close or initially relatively normal um, compliance despite markedly elevated chant fraction. And hence the transmission of PEEP to the pleural pressure may be higher in these cases than in classical RDS patients, at least in the uh, initial states. And if we look at the level of, um, of shunt uh, estimated, by the way, by the PF ratio uh, that we have here in these very recent data from the Italian group in the Lombardy region, um, you can see that the PF ratio is a 125, 150 uh, um, as a median value. But you can also see that the median PEEP is uh, 13 to 14 um, centimeters of water. So quite elevated uh, pressure that is applied in this condition. And that of course will contribute to significant um, hemodynamic alterations in these conditions. So uh, perhaps the heart-lung interactions will be more uh, present in these patients um, with COVID-19 than in classical RDS, but we still do not know exactly um, because we do not have uh, enough data published in this specific subtype of patients. So if we think at the principle of heart-lung interactions, um, these are quite variable and will be applied on two different ways. 
on one hand, it will be looking at the repercussions of the mechanical ventilation on the heart and then on cardiac output and on the heart and on the um, um, backflow to the uh, um, CVP and then on the um, peripheral organs in, uh, by the increase in venous pressure. And on the other hand, we have also to discuss the response to fluids, which can also be assessed, of course, by the heart-lung interactions. So the principle is that, of course, ventilation will induce cyclic changes in intrathoracic pressure, and that these changes will affect, as again, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, preload and afterload of these ventricles. So during inspiration, there is an increase in the right ventricle afterload. And of course, this may decrease the cardiac output or stroke volume of the right ventricle. Um, the impact of ventilation of the um, um, right ventricle afterload is somewhat dependent on the volume um, of uh, the tidal volume of our patients, and we will discuss this by this relatively old physiologic data. What we know is that we have some alveolar vessels, and we have also extra alveolar vessels. What occurs is during um, tidal ventilation, there is, of course, an increase in the lung volume during ventilation, and this will squeeze the alveolar vessels and will, on the other hand, distend somewhat the extra alveolar vessels. And so, if we look at the impact on the vascular resistance on the different vessels, for the alveolar vessels, there is a progressive increase in the resistance of these vessels because indeed these vessels will, uh, be, will be squeezed during the um, increase in the tidal volume. On the other hand, for the um, extra alveolar vessels, because these will be dilating, on the other hand, there will be a decrease in the resistance of these. So the sum, uh, which is the resistance that the uh, right ventricle, ventricle is seeing, is like a U-curve with a minimal resistance at the level of the functional residual capacity. The issue is that we ventilate these patients, usually selecting the PEEV to have the best functional residual capacity, and so we'll increase during ventilation the resistance, and of course, the higher the tidal volume, the higher the increase in resistance in this condition. As you can also see, the relationship is not really um, um, linear, it's more exponential one, increasing even further with even higher tidal volumes in these conditions. The other part is the fact that there is a decrease in right ventricle preload. And of course, this is just due to the increase in intrathoracic pressure. Both of these effects will decrease is right ventricle stroke volume. This has been nicely illustrated by uh, Antoine Verbaron and his team in that uh, trial a few years ago when they looked with the transesophageal echo at the dimension of the right ventricle um, during uh, inspiration and expiration. And what they described is that there is a decrease in the stroke volume here, the, 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 the the diastolic uh, area, the uh, systolic area, and of course the difference here is the stroke volume. You can see that there is a huge decrease in stroke volume during inspiration. And this, incre this decrease in stroke volume was due to a combined effect on one hand on a decrease in the right ventricle preload because indeed the diastolic area decreased during uh, the inspiration, but also an increase in the right ventricle absolute uh, on the same hand. So the combined effect here play a role on this decrease in stroke volume. So there is also an effect on the left ventricle, and there is an increase in the left ventricle preload. Why is there an increase on the left ventricle preload? Because there is some squeezing during ventilation of the um, uh, pulmonary vessels. Indeed, the pulmonary vascular bed is estimated in normal conditions around 400 milliliters. How much is it affected by disease is not well known, but what we can indeed see is that during uh, inspiration, there will be compression of this pulmonary vascular bed, and this amount of blood will be squeezed to the left ventricle, and so increasing the uh, preload of the left ventricle exactly at the same time. 
And so there is a, some variation in the left uh, and right ventricular stroke volume over one respiratory cycle. And this has been very nicely shown by some physiologists from the Netherlands in the early 19th. And this is just one of these um, measurements showing that indeed the primary blood volume is decreasing during inspiration and increasing again during expiration. At the same time, what you can see, sorry, is that we have for the right ventricle a decrease in stroke volume during inspiration and an increase here during expiration. And so, of course, the average cardiac output will be preserved, but uh, this will, of course, uh, be some variation between inspiration and expiration in the uh, stroke volume itself. There is a second factor, of course, for the left ventricle, which is a decrease in the left ventricle afterload. And um, if we realize schematically um, is that to produce some pressure outside the thorax, when we apply no pressure in the thorax, the ventricle needs to generate, uh, of course, the same identical pressure. If we have, on the other hand, uh, we apply some pressure in the thorax to generate the same pressure, the ventricle needs to generate a lower pressure. And this is just illustrating this uh, uh, decrease in level afterload that is uh, applicated by the um, intrathoracic pressure um, during mechanical ventilation. So both of these effects on the left ventricle may, of course, increase the left ventricle stroke volume. We can immediately, of course, realize that the increase in left ventricle stroke volume will be higher in conditions where the patient is preload dependent, because of course, in this condition, the increase in the left ventricle preload will increase the stroke volume. But even in patients who are not um, uh, preload responsive, the decrease in afterload may in some conditions already increase somewhat the left ventricle stroke volume. Usually it will be quite minimal, so we'll see that uh, the uh, heart lung interactions can be used to really predict the response to fluids. During expiration, the, uh, there is something different occurring on the left ventricle because there is the decrease in the left ventricle preload here that will be related to the transmission to the left ventricle of the decreased right ventricle stroke volume, and this occurs after a few cardiac beats. So usually, um, because we have during the inspiration the decrease in the right ventricle stroke volume, this uh, uh, reach the left ventricle only as the initiation of the expiration. So we see only the decrease in left ventricle volume only during expiration. And this was nicely illustrated in the 60s um, in an, an experimental conditions. Here we can see a true measurement of vena cava flow. And we can see that immediately after insufflation, there is a decrease in vena cava flow. And of course, during expiration, there is a return back of the vena cava flow here. When we look at the pulmonary artery flow, we have uh, a decrease in pulmonary artery flow, just one beat after the uh, inspiration. And this occurs during all the inspiration and returns back to normal during the expiration. For the uh, aortic flow, you can see that initially there is an increase in the aortic flow, but during the early expiration, there is a decrease in the aortic flow. So there is a time lag between the decrease in vena cava flow here and the decrease in aortic flow, which is the transit time um, through the lung. And this transit time through the lung may sub be somewhat variable uh, from one patient to, to another patient, but it usually takes three to four beats, heartbeats to uh, be transmitted. What is the impact on the right ventricle of mechanical ventilation? And so leading to the development of the acute core pulmonale. So this uh, uh, is mostly related to the presence of pulmonary hypertension uh, in patients with RDS. And um, there is a decrease in vascular bed and especially due to microembolies that occur. And we do not know exactly in COVID-19, but we have seen several patients with microscopic pulmonary embolism uh, occurring. Uh, we have also seen that there is a high increase in uh, D-dimers and this increase in procoglone state. So it is very likely that these microemboli also occur in COVID-19. There is also reduced lung volume, and this is a little bit uh, more um, debatable, of course, at least in the early phases of COVID-19. 
for the mediators, there are a lot of mediators that are released um, that are uh, increasing the pulmonary artery pressure and may, of course, uh, play a role there. And the very important factor at the end is the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, which also play a role, of course, in this uh, pulmonary hypertension. So, what are the impacts of mechanical ventilation here? During inspiration, there will be the increase in the afterload of the right ventricle, um, and this will decrease the right ventricle stroke volume. And on the left ventricle, uh, during, uh, there will be a decrease in preload um, that will be mostly occurring because the dilation of the right ventricle compresses the left ventricle and decreases the preload in this condition, which is a little bit different from the pure hypovolemic patient. The, it is also important uh, to realize that the vascular resistance are influenced by the west zones, uh, being maximal um, in zone one and uh, lower in zone three. To which extent these are affected by the, um, in, in, the pneumonia in these patients is still something we need to look at uh, because it's interesting to realize that uh, um, uh, because of the lack of condensation, it is very likely that we may face a lot of zone one patient, uh, zone one areas in these patients. What are indeed the implications of the different west zones is that in um, uh, zone three, we have the pulmonary artery pressure, which is um, uh, higher than the pulmonary venous pressure, when both are higher than the alveolar pressure. During inspiration in these conditions, there is an increase in the alveolar pressure and transform uh, zone three into zone two, because indeed at that time, the pulmonary artery pressure is still of course higher than the pulmonary venous pressure, but the uh, alveolar pressure becomes higher than the venous pressure and hence is increasing the resistance in these uh, conditions. So one may expect that the protective ventilation that we apply in many patients by limiting tidal volume and of course limiting drying pressure and plateau pressure may limit the incidence in, of acute corpulmonale. But what are exactly the consequences on the right ventricle function? Well, the problem is that the right ventricle is ex very sensitive to an increase in its afterload. These are data from Rome 1 showing that indeed the right ventricle uh, decreases stroke volume for a minimal increase in the pressure in, in the pulmonary artery. And the right ventricle cannot adapt to acute changes in its afterload. And Of, unfortunately, it dilates under uh, abnormal condition, and this will have major implications because of the interventricular dependence. If the right ventricle dilates, this will have you know, influence on the left ventricle. Indeed, uh, we have here the dilation of the right ventricle, and then the squeezing of the left ventricle that cannot really uh, be filled adequately. And in these conditions, we have a decrease in the left ventricle stroke volume in these conditions. And this is exactly what we see here in this patient. We have here um, the left ventricle, the left atrium, the right ventricle, the right atrium. And you can see here the distension of the right, uh, right side cavities. And during each inspiration, we can even see here uh, the interatrial septum really bowing even further uh, to the left side, uh, compressing further the uh, left heart cavities. And so there are several ways to look at it. I will not go into the details. This is more for specialists in echocardiography, but the higher the dilation of the right ventricle, uh, the, the more severe the, the condition of the right ventricle. Importantly, and this was again nicely shown by uh, Antoine Verbaron a few years ago, is that the total area of the uh, total volume of the heart is quite similar in patients without acute core pulmonary and patients with acute core pulmonary. Uh, 
But the difference is really that the right heart is dilated at the expense of the left heart, so that the total volume is identical, but the left heart is really uh, of minimal size, and hence cardiac output is decreased in these conditions. Another very important aspect is the development of the paradoxical septal movement. What is exactly the paradoxical septal movement? Well, the left heart, when there is an increase in its uh, afterload, will have exactly the same um, um, uh, systolic time. However, uh, for the right heart, when there is an increase in the right ventricular afterload by an increase in right ventricular uh, in the primary artery pressure, in these conditions, there is an increase in the systolic time. And the consequence of the increase in the systolic time is that at the end of the systole, uh, when there is significant pulmonary hypertension, um, the uh, pressure in the right ventricle will be higher than the pressure in the left ventricle. And this will induce a shift in the septum from the left heart, uh, from the left side, uh, from the right heart to the left uh, side of the heart. So we can see here this bowing occurring here at the end of the systole as you can see here. And here again, a very nice example here, where you can see this bowing here occurring exactly at the end of systole. Just because it was a little bit more rapid, just to show here, in diastole, you can see here the uh, left heart here, the uh, aortic valve here, and so look here at the septum here. So we are here in diastole. We begin here uh, the systole with the opening of the uh, aortic valve, early systole here, and we see the septum here quite nicely in the middle. What we see here, just at the end of the um, uh, systole here, just at the end of the T wave, you can see the flattening of this, um, of this uh, interventricular septum occurring here because indeed the pressure is higher on the right side, beginning to compress the right heart on these conditions. And again, close to normal uh, during diastole here. What is the impact of mechanical ventilation? We can see here the pulmonary artery pressure or pulmonary artery flow detected here by uh, ECO. And you can see that during um, expiration here and inspiration here, there is a marked fluctuation in this, um, in this uh, uh, right ventricular stroke volume. And this is indeed due to the uh, increase in right ventricular uh, pressure uh, during the inspiration of this patient here. This was also nicely demonstrated by invasive measurements in the 80s by François Jardin, who showed that indeed here we have the left uh, ventricle pressure, the right ventricle pressure. They applied uh, elevated PEEP in these patients with RDS from increasing from 0 to 20. And we can see not only we have a decrease in the left ventricle pressure, but also we can see here at the end of the systole, we have the pressure in the right ventricle that is higher than the pressure in the uh, left ventricle, uh, so inducing this uh, paradoxical septal movement. And there are several factors that can indeed lead to the uh, acute corpomonale. Uh, some of these include the uh, hypercapnia that is uh, uh, present, and you have seen when you treat many of these patients with COVID-19, we can see that hypercapnia is very frequently occurring in many of these patients when they begin to be uh, ventilated. And also the plateau pressure uh, is also a very important factor leading to this acute corpomonale. And the actual incidence in, uh, let's say, normal RDS patients uh, is around 20%. Um, we do not know exactly what is the actual incidence of acute corporeality in patients with COVID-19. Uh, this needs still to be evaluated uh, in these patients. What is the impact of volume status on the development of uh, acute corporeality? One may think that perhaps the best solution will be to keep this patient as dry as possible. Maybe this is not exactly the, the best solution because indeed, uh, the, when we give volume, what will be occurring is that we will increase the left atrial pressure. And by increasing the left atrial pressure, we will also modify the pulmonary venous pressure. And interestingly, what you can see here is that when we apply some, some filling to these patients by giving fluids, we increase the pulmonary venous pressure and we increase by this way the uh, amount of zone two and zone one compared uh, to other conditions here. So by increasing this, we will uh, favor, um, we will decrease 
um, the um, vascular resistance by decreasing zone one, uh, transforming the zone one into zone two, and transforming also zone two into zone three. So the net results will be that by giving fluids, well, we may decrease the vascular resistance into the heart. You say this is just perhaps conceptual, or it's not really conceptual. This is a very nice experiment from the group of um, of Bicetre, uh, Jean Utebul and Xavier Monet um, with Emily Fougier. And what they did is that they uh, increased, um, well, they looked at pulmonary vascular resistance by increasing PEEP, and they saw indeed that in these conditions there is an increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance here. But what they also did, did at a high PEEP, they did a passive leg raising test, so increasing the intrathoracic blood volume by this way. And what they did in there is that they returned the um, pulmonary vascular resistance to the baseline. So this is really showing that the filling um, of the left atrium uh, adequately may somewhat reduce the uh, pulmonary vascular resistance and maybe in some conditions also uh, improve the right ventricular function uh, indirectly uh, by these conditions. So what, um, what are indeed the, the impacts on the uh, uh, rhyodynamic function and cardiac output? Uh, we, we need to look at this in particular, of course, in the context of COVID-19, and we do not have a lot of data there um, uh, at this stage. What are the use of uh, heart-lung interactions to predict the fluid responsiveness? Well, we could do a lot of different things, but the most important and the most well described is, of course, the respiratory variations in stroke volume uh, that we can use here um, in many of these patients there. Um, then what we do is basically evaluating the preload responsiveness during trends and change in preload induced by a respiratory maneuver there. And so what we have basically is a tidal volume induces changes in preload. And when we are on the flat part of the starting relationship, there is no change in stroke volume. When we are on the steep part, there will be a change here in stroke volume. And this, of course, when we look at these respiratory changes in stroke volume, this will predict uh, or might predict the response of fluids. Here we can see uh, looking at this by ECO and showing that indeed during ventilation there is a marked fluctuation in the um, aortic uh, stroke volume. But this can also be, of course, uh, evaluated by several uh, indirect means, including uh, here the uh, pulse pressure variations as described again by the Bicetre group a few years ago also. And several studies have shown that um, uh, pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variations very nicely uh, predict the response to fluids um, in, um, in many conditions and um, that the uh, rock curve area is really nice in these conditions um, and that um, the way uh, that these patients can be categorized as responders and non-responders is really well performed using this uh, heart lung interaction test. And um, both the positive um, predictive value and the negative predictive values are very good in these conditions. So the problem is that we unfortunately have uh, some limitations. And this, of course, may be even more pronounced in the context of uh, protective mechanical ventilation that we apply in these patients. The first aspect is, of course, the low tidal volume. And um, we have demonstrated um, a few years ago that when a low tidal volume lower than eight minutes per kilogram is used in these patients, the predict prediction of the response to fluids is really lost in these conditions. And this is a little bit uh, worrisome because uh, we more and more ventilated our patients with tidal volumes lower than eight compared to what we did previously. Um, high respiratory rates are also um, a way to unfortunately uh, lose uh, the, the predictive value. And here, uh, change without changing the uh, uh, I to E ratio here, uh, we change the respiratory rate from 15 to 30. And several patients here already at 30 have no more uh, post pressure variations. And of course, these were totally lost at 40. So when we increase the respiratory rate, we may unfortunately uh, also uh, lose the prediction of the response of fit using this test. And this is perhaps dependent on the uh, heart rate also. And so what we found is that uh, with a heart rate um, to a respiratory rate ratio uh, above 3.6, uh, 
uh, we have a very good prediction of the responsive rate. Below, uh, we lose it completely. Low driving pressures are also uh, a factor playing a role. And these are uh, some data from uh, some French investigators showing that indeed, when the uh, driving pressure was um, uh, low, uh, we did not have um, a very good uh, identification of our fluid responders. Uh, however, when the driving pressure was quite high, above 20, which is a really, really quite uncommon, fortunately, um, then of course, we can predict much better the response of fluids. In unselected patients, um, it begins to be a little bit less well performing. And again, most of the factors associating with the uh, um, good response were really having high tidal volume, having high driving pressure, having a high compliance, um, uh, and um, having also a high heart rate to respiratory rate ratio. So this is, of course, not always observed in our patients um, with RDS, and especially here in the context of uh, COVID-19 uh, RDS patients. The corpulmonale itself may also be a limiting factor. And this was uh, nicely demonstrated by uh, Yazid Majoub and Michel Slama in Amiens. And what they looked is that the pulse pressure variation was identical in patients responding to feed and not responding to feed here. But the important aspect is that in these non-responders, these patients had significant right heart dysfunction um, as related by the ratio between the right side and left heart um, um, uh, size. And so when the right ventricle is dilated, uh, we can have some pulse pressure variations, but these are no more respond related to the fact that the patient will respond to fluid, but much more to the fact that these patients have acute pulmonale. And this is, of course, a major limitation, especially in the context of the COVID-19 and 40. So can be the tidal volume challenge used to try to, uh, to detect patients who are ventilated with protective ventilation? Well, this was um, a hypothesis generated by uh, Shida Meatra in, um, in, in Mumbai, and uh, together with Jean-Luc Teboul uh, and Xavi Monet. And what they tested is a, a transient increase in tidal volume uh, from six to eight um, to unmask respiratory variations in stroke volume. And so it's a complicated slide, but the most important aspect here is that uh, when we looked at uh, the pulse pressure variations, you can see that when the tidal volume was increased, the pulse pressure variation was increased in responders, but not in non-responders. But for the prediction, it was not just increasing the tidal volume from six to eight, but mostly looking at the changes from six to eight. And as we can see here, the changes in pulse pressure variation from uh, six to eight were, were really markedly predicting the response to fluid which was much more the case here than just looking at the individual variables uh, values at a six or eight in these patients. So the dynamic aspect changing from six to eight is much more relevant from any measurement done at six or any measurement done at eight in these patients. And this is nicely uh, shown here by uh, several cutoffs here, but very uh, good ruptures um, uh, with this uh, type of analysis here. One of the uh, problems still remains that um, uh, we still may have an issue by increasing the tidal volume, and that uh, especially um, when we increase a little bit too much the tidal volume, we may sometimes induce the, um, uh, some false positive in some patients, especially as illustrated here. Um, this change in stroke volume here is relatively minimal and probably not um, valuable in many of these patients. So it still carries a risk of false positive uh, response in non-responders. But the most important aspect um, uh, for today is that um, the changes in pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation would also uh, be more prominent in um, acute or even chronic core pulmonary. And especially if we increase the tidal volume, we increase the vascular resistance in the pulmonary artery, and hence they also increase in these conditions, the pulse pressure and stroke volume variations. So we need perhaps before doing this test, have some eco assessment of the right ventricle just to ensure that indeed our patients do not have acute core pulmonary. Otherwise, these tests cannot really differentiate between stroke volume, responders to fluids, and on the other hand, 
acute core pulmonale. Is the end expiration test uh, an alternative? Well, this can, of course, by doing some uh, pose here, by uh, an expiration pose, we can see that there could be here an increase in stroke volume detected here uh, by different ways. Here, it was mostly uh, the uh, Arctic Doppler that was used, and that indeed, by some changes here um, during the pose, it can identify responders to fluid in these conditions. One of the things is that um, the Cutoff of 5% is a little bit uh, uh, minimal and uh, some way to perhaps have a better prediction is to combine um, the end inspiratory with uh, end expiratory occlusion so that we have indeed the effects of both respiratory occlusions which predicts much better the response to fluid than any individual rest, uh, occlusion here um, and especially the cutoff here of 13% is much more easy to detect than a cutoff of 5% or 8% here in the other way around. But the similar restrictions of uh, the context of protective mechanical ventilation apply to this test because indeed, when the tidal volume is too low, the changes even during expiration, uh, the occlusion will be uh, relatively minimal. And of course, an acute core pulmonale will also be improved by the uh, end uh, expiration occlusion. So, um, unfortunately, we still need to do the eco before doing this kind of test just to ensure that the patient is not on the acute corporal side. And so, the uh, prediction of fluid responsiveness using heart lung interactions remains difficult in RDS patients because of the specific ventilatory settings that we apply in these patients and the incidence of acute corporal of at least 20% in many of these patients. And with this, I uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, Daniel. That was a, a fantastic presentation. Um, and even though you had a mask on, we could hear you very clearly. <laughs> so, so, so thank you for this. Um, we have a few questions coming in, but first of all, I'd just like to um, ask you something uh, about the different kinds of patients we're seeing. So what me and my colleagues are seeing is the two different kinds of patients that have been identified. So first of all, we have the patient who comes in and maybe initially they have a good compliance. We can, uh, we can ventilate them with a lower PEEP and maybe a higher tidal volume, eight mils per kilogram. Um, they have a low plateau pressure. And when we, when we have a look at them with an echo, their, their heart seems relatively preserved and maybe quite hyperdynamic. And then we see the second kind of patient. So, so the first kind of patient probably is relatively easy to do the tidal volume challenge and look at post pressure variation and we can get some quite good information. Then the second kind of patient, and uh, it may be a progression from the first is when we start to see the low compliance the hypercarbia we're going to really high peeps high plateaus and when we do the echo and look at the right ventricle we start to see right ventricular um, after load is increasing we see a dilatation uh, and in extreme examples we see really poor right ventricular function but with a sort of uh, an underfilled quite hyperdynamic left ventricle um, is often what we're seeing so uh, I mean, and clearly we've talked about sort of microvascular thrombosis on, on, on in, in the pulmonary vasculature. So, so these patients are clearly a lot more difficult to sort of understand and to investigate for, for hemodynamics. I wonder what your experience is and whether you have any comments about these two different kinds of patients. So you're totally right. I mean, these are two different phenotypes. Hopefully they occur, let's say, in two different um time presentation also it's uh, this usual um good compliance initially um and but possibility to ventilate this patient with a moderate peep uh, initially um and these patients also have usually a relatively good cardiac function even though we have seen patient with a left heart dysfunction um uh, quite several times also but usually these patients have relatively good heart function and also because of the uh, digestive um, symptoms like diarrhea and so on, 
often these patients are hypovolemic initially. We intuitively try to limit the amount of fluids in these patients, uh, but nevertheless, uh, these patients are probably the patients who may benefit from some optimization globally of their fluids volume uh, status. Uh, I, I don't say that we need to give a lot of fluids to these patients. It's not exactly what I mean, but we need perhaps to be careful when you give fluids. Uh, and fortunately, it is in these patients that the heart-lung interactions will work better than in the other one. Um, in this second uh, pattern, as you mentioned, first, um, these patients have a very low compliance. We use high PEEPs, they have a high tight um, plateau pressure. They have also often acute corporeality due to different factors, including um, the ventral settings on one hand, hypercabia on the other hand also. And of course, um, these patients um, may not tolerate fluids very much. So I think that uh, um, it's good to try to have an identification of these patients, not only um, by looking at the ventilatory aspects on one hand, but also to perform eco to ensure that uh, in, in the conditions, especially in second hand conditions, that in these patients we do not face acute corpomonality because the management may be a little bit different in these conditions. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yes, I mean, it's uh, it's what we're all saying and it's certainly uh, what my colleagues have been discussing. We have found echo to be really, really useful in these patients. The windows aren't always great. Um, <laughs> so there's a possibility for, for TOE, TE. Uh, but where we get some nice images, it's really crucial. Um, uh, and, it, and the right ventricle is the key um, thing yeah. to be able to visualize here, I think. Um, and this is what uh, one of the questions we have is how do you suggest to monitor the impact of mechanical ventilation on the RV? So this is where ECHO really comes into its own. I mean, we've been trying to promote ECHO and develop um, critical care ECHO for years, uh, along with Antoine and a number of others. And I think now is where we're really seeing the benefit of that with people able to do ECHO and uh, machines available. I think other investigations, for example, pulmonary artery catheter are, are useful. And they can show you quite nicely the right ventricular um, stroke volume, particularly the newer catheters where you can get a real time um, stroke volume. But the only problem is where we're so stretched on intensive care to have the time to put the pulmonary artery catheters in for our doctors to have the time to get the information is, is not quite so easy. So we're we're finding echo much more useful at this point. Yes, but um, we need to, to pay attention to cont contamination aspects. And this perhaps is the uh, most important limitation for um, a widespread eco uh, at this stage. It's really the fact that uh, approaching to these patients is always a little bit uh, more tricky um, because of the risk of a contamination of the healthcare personnel uh, in these conditions. Yeah, no, we have a uh, we have dirty machines now, so we <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we managed to order a lot of echo machines. My colleagues, so um, there's. Uh, another question: now, How many, how many patients will have this phenotype of acute uh, core pulmonale? Uh, and the question is: Can we identify these patients by poor response to recruitment, or higher than expected uh, dynamic compliance in the ventilator? And if we identify the acute core pulmonale, should we treat it? Uh, any thoughts on that one, Daniel? Well, um, there are several questions there, um, yeah. and so the, uh, the most important um, is uh, how to suspect it, and um, the, the problem is that we really have uh, many of the factors that uh, the usual suspects uh, that are present in, um, in these patients. As you mentioned, the uh, high plateau pressure, the hypercabia um, or acidosis are factors associated with uh, the development of acute corpulmonale. Infection of the, um, uh, the chest uh, and the lung infection is also one factor. And so, um, by the way, most of the factors there are present in these patients, at least, as we mentioned, in the second phase of the uh, COVID-19 uh, RDS disease. Um, so, um, many patients are uh, potentially affected. We do not know exactly uh, the incidence in this specific 
uh, COVID-19 uh, pneumonia uh, compared to usual RDS? Um, is it close to the 20% uh, as usual? Is it higher? Is it lower? We do not know exactly. We do not have this kind of series of uh, ECO uh, to help us uh, at this stage, unfortunately. Um, the, um, uh, the question on do, you, do we matter uh, of uh, having uh, acute corporeal yes or not? I think it's quite important uh, aspect. Of course, um, what we want on one hand is to protect the heart, uh, to protect the lungs, sorry. But on the other hand, um, if we have uh, this uh, right heart dysfunction, uh, which is associated at some point with some decreased cardiac output, but also some increase um, in the uh, venous pressure um, and venous stasis, all these factors may have uh, really uh, major implications um, in our patients. So the way we perhaps adjust the ventilatory settings um, may be somewhat important there. And um, at least in our center, it is one of the component um, that we take in our minds when we discuss uh, either ECMO or in some of the other patients, uh, the um, ECHO or the CO2 removal uh, in some of these patients. Because CO2 removal can be sometimes interesting um, uh, to decrease uh, the um, um, severity of the ventilatory conditions while preserving uh, the uh, CO2 levels, the PCO2 levels, and preventing uh, severe hypercapnia in some of these patients. So this is a way that uh, we can approach this. Whether it will be improving outcome or not, we do not know yet, but um, it sounds logical to try to limit um, both this, this strain on the, from mechanical ventilation on the lungs, but also the strain of mechanical ventilation uh, on the heart on the other way. Yes, and it, it's difficult to sometimes to know what to do with these patients. Um, I, I think there was a patient the other day who had a, sort of moderately dilated right heart um, and they had an unreactive IVC when I looked at them with echo but a very small and dynamic left ventricle so um, and interestingly they had a, they had a very high cardiac output which is around eight nine liters a minute mm -hmm. so it, it, it's difficult to know what to do with these um, clearly that patient was moving towards the uh, sort of core pulmonale the cardiac output was adequate, but they were also developing, they developed renal failure. So maybe the cardiac output wasn't actually adequate. So you, you have to be very careful with the fluids. Uh, now, the other solutions that are being considered, obviously, for acute core pulmonale are, are the use of nitric oxide. Um, not available universally and sometimes difficult to use, but it's an option. Um, you could try a drug like milrinone. But uh, this has a problem with causing hypotension, or hypotension also. So this this can be a problem because we're seeing a lot of patients who are quite hypotensive. Um, we've looked at sildenafil, which we haven't actually used, which is a potential NG. Um, this obviously has a problem if you have some liver dysfunction. And there's, the other option is also prostacycline, which can also cause hypotension. So there's a number of solutions. I think potentially you have to tailor them to the individual um, but, but be be really careful about um, the unwanted effects of these uh, treatments. Um, so there's um, there's another question about acute corpinale. Um Question here: Should we should we still be targeting a PEEP of more than 15 millimeters of mercury, given a high driving pressure, hypoxemia, maybe due to perfusion dysregulation? Any, well, any thoughts on that? Sorry. So I think that the high PEEP or, or low PEEP is really a very um, uh, difficult question because um, uh, it's, it's such an individual response of the patient that uh, I don't like to say high PEEP, low PEEP. I think that uh, uh, we should discuss more the best PEEP for that specific patient. And the best PEEP for that specific patient is taking into account both is lung properties, including compliance and the response to uh, a PEEP titration, and also uh, the response part um, in these conditions. Uh, just dysfunction of the right ventricle should not prevent um, increasing somewhat um, the PEEP that can still be tolerated, uh, especially if there is some recruitment. 
the quotability of a patient with COVID-19 um, is not uh, that obvious, uh, but nevertheless, response to PEEP is often um, relatively good um, in, in many of these patients. Um, in terms of uh, oxygenation and sometimes even in improvement um, or stabilization of these of the compliance. But um, the tolerance of the right ventricle is really uh, very difficult to predict um, from what we see even with the echo. The, and unless you have really the acute core pulmonale, whereas with the uh, um, paradoxical septum movement, Paradoxical septal movement, uh, these patients will not tolerate any increase in the right ventricular afterload. However, if we just, if I can say like this, have some right ventricular dysfunction with some moderate dilation of the right ventricle, then some of these patients may still uh, respond to, pre, to, to, to PEEP in a favorable way. So um, it's always a balance. And so um, just as we do uh, the uh, free challenge, which is challenging the system, measuring, measuring the response. Um, we should also do this uh, PEEP challenge, which is indeed challenging our patients by increasing the PEEP, looking at the respiratory mechanics on one hand, but also looking at the hemodynamic, um, including the echo, uh, I think, on the other hand. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a really nice concept, the PEEP challenge, um, because, I mean, as you say, that the right ventricle will tolerate preload quite well but not afterload and we, we don't always know this and where these patients are uh, uh, until we try changing the peep uh, some tolerate it and, and, and some don't tolerate it well um, the question here is uh, this is all fascinating but shouldn't we keep the patient in the fluid responder group to avoid fluid overload um, yeah that's a very nice question I mean what what we should also remember, sometimes we've found these patients are actually really quite hypovolemic due to, to high temperatures. So also you have to remember if they don't respond, it's sometimes because maybe you haven't given enough fluid. Um, um, as uh, I, Mauricio was always very keen on the concept is that the non-responders you may just not have given enough. So, um, mm -hmm. so that's always something to, to bear in mind as well. Um, uh, comments on that, Daniel? Well, I, I think, yes, I mean, on, on one hand, if the patient is really perfect, um, relatively dry, this can be um, satisfactory. The problem is that it is not always the case. And uh, some of these patients arrive in the hospital with uh, some significant renal dysfunction. And many of these patients is related to the fact that they had high temperatures, sweating a lot, uh, diarrhea, which is also a very common uh, aspect. They are also so tired and, and so they do not have really, a, um, they do not want to, to, to drink or uh, they do not eat uh, anything. And so they are, some, some of these patients are really dehydrated initially. Um, and when you put these patients under mechanical ventilation, you even further um, impair uh, these, uh, the hemodynamics of these patients. So. Uh, giving some uh, norepinephrine to preserve blood pressure is okay when you just have vasodilation, but when you have a severe hypovolemia on top of this, it's probably not the best solution. So we need to avoid uh, severe hypovolemia. We need to uh, uh, prevent giving too much fluids to these patients also on the other hand. <coughs> yeah, thank you. So, um, uh, question, what is your fluid?
there would strategy been for these patients being they seem to evolve from one phenotype to another I, I i think we've tried to answer that question um you have to challenge these patients really to know um and it's i think it's important to institute hemodynamic monitoring early um and also to understand carefully where the patient is uh, in terms of um these different disease patterns that we've recognized um another question are you using uh, te routinely and how are you cleaning the probes um mm. we're not using te routinely uh we use it if we really have to and then we we try not to um to t tell the cardiologist if we, about what we've done with the probes um uh, I, you, you can get uh, quite good windows and i would encourage if you if you don't get the normal windows have a look at the subcostal because you can get some really nice subcostal images often with the high peep the heart's just displaced a bit uh, inferiorly and you can get nice subcostal long and short axis which will give you a good possibly the best picture of the right ventricle and and also obviously the ivc uh i'm just going down um uh what else have we got what maneuvers would you recommend to find optimal peep um with monitoring uh right ventricular function so i think i think we've uh we've discussed that one um there was a question about proning um it's not necessarily related to the hemodynamics but um obviously people have got a lot of questions about all aspects of management uh, given all the interactions mentioned should the patient go prone in order to improve gas exchange before reaching high peak pressures oh. um, I, it, it's difficult to know the effect of being prone on uh, hemodynamics but uh yeah. any comment well I, I will not comment too much on the uh ideal timing of proning i think that uh, um, we base most of our discussion on pf ratio based on the guerin trial and other trials but uh, um, when we decide to prone it's uh, it's really something very important um, that we have some improvement often in the hemodynamics also of these patients and um, most of the effect is probably driven by the improvement um, in the right ventricular functions that were observed. This was nicely demonstrated a few years ago by the group of um, Antoine Vera Baron again about uh, performing TE before and just after, and confirmed by some other French group doing even TE during proning that um, the right ventricle um, is um, uh, offloaded uh, during prone uh, position uh, by several factors, and that at the end, the radical function is really markedly improved by proning our, our patients. So one um, way to really improve both the ventilatory um, conditions on one hand and um, protecting the lungs on one hand and protecting the heart is indeed using prone in, in many of these patients. Yes, uh, and I think a lot of the questions are really on these themes of, how, of treating acute corporate corp corporal manale um, and how we titrate PEEP. So uh, it's quite clear that uh, people are all encountering the same uh, issues. Um, and, and I think uh, the idea of the volume challenge and also the PEEP challenge, uh, and which, which both tell you about volume and both tell you about ventilation, um, I, I think are very useful in this context. Uh, there's quite a few people asking uh, about di different therapies we use um and for example inhaled milrinone i haven't got i haven't got any um really experience with inhaled milrinone in these patients uh i i i think it could potentially avoid the syst the systemic effects of hypotension you can get with milrinone so i think it's it's maybe worth a try obviously one has to be a little bit careful about aerosols and uh, using yeah. sort of in, in, inhaled things like that so it, it could be problematic from that point of view uh, we've talked a little bit about um, uh, right ventricular echo parameters. Certainly, we look at the septal position. You need to look at things like TAPSI. You need to actually just measure the right ventric ventricle and also measure the right ventricle. Look at the relative diameter um, or, or area compared with the left ventricle and um, the sort of standard measures of uh, in critical care echo that we use. Um, for uh, Nick, uh, for this aspect, I think that for a little bit more advanced people, looking at the pulmonary active flow um, is very important because when you look at this variability 
and also sometimes the morphology of the um, aortic uh, of the pulmonary artery flow is very important because the pulmonary artery flow, uh, when it, there is some significant variability there, this means that the ventricle, ventricle uh, coupling with the arterial uh, pressure is really not very good, and so we have a uh, ventricular arterial decoupling when we have this kind of uh, fluctuation in pulmonary artery flow that we can detect by echo relatively easily. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, listen, um, it's it's now, well, it's four o'clock here, so we have to draw this to conclusion because I know Daniel has to go and I have to actually uh, uh, video into another meeting. So, we've had so many questions. Uh, we very much appreciate your attention and your questions. We could, I think, carry on for another hour and discuss this subject. But I, I, I hope that, I, and I know that uh, Antoine is doing a, uh, an ECHO webinar uh, in, about COVID patients. So uh, I, I think that's very much one to tune into too. Uh, I think this will go up on the website, the ESCOM website in, in time, so so you can um, you can recommend it to your colleagues. So it just uh, remains to say thank you very much for ESCOM for organising this. Thank you very much to Daniel for the excellent presentation. And we really wish everyone the best of luck and try and stay safe and stay healthy whilst treating all your patients in critical care. Thank you.